Subaru, thank you. No, definitely. Welcome, everyone. It's great for us to share this, what feels like a little bit of calm before the hustle and bustle of the holiday season really kicks into full gear. We thought we could spend some time this afternoon talking about historic preservation, of course, with an emphasis on East Chester, Tuckahoe, and maybe we'll get into Bronxville a little bit. But there is a lot to think about in this large concept of historic preservation, but we're gonna break it down into bite-sized components that really bring us home. So we're traveling back in the past, but not to hang out with old relics, but rather to appreciate buildings of the past as living relics that are part of our thriving communities. So Dick Porliano and I have had the pleasure, if I can speak for both of us, of working quite a bit with historic preservation. He much more than I, as he goes back and uh, in, for decades as, as the village uh, town historian. I'll let him introduce himself for a second. I'll tell you a little bit about me, Jenny Steinhagen. I, for the last few years, have been living and breathing historic preservation in my role with the Tuckahoe Historic Preservation Commission. I was fortunate enough to participate in Westchester Community College and SUNY Peak Skills joint program in historic preservation. I did a certificate and a field study, which exposed me to all the ins and outs of legislation of historic preservation as well as how a community can come together to value the structures that they know and love. I also do some work with the Westchester County Historical Society and as the Tuckahoe Historic Preservation Commission evolved over the last few years from a task force, we enacted legislation that I don't know if anyone here is familiar with, but I hope that you will be familiar with it after the end of today's presentation. And I was very fortunate to be involved with working with the State Historic Preservation Office and the development of that legislation. So anything that I have acquired over these last few years, if it is of any interest or benefit to anyone here tonight, it is my pleasure and privilege to share with you some insights. There may be some questions about particular sites or particular activities and engagement that a community can get involved with with when it comes to historic preservation. So I'd like to make this talk today fluid. So if you have any questions at any point, I encourage you to bring them up and we can steer the conversation accordingly. But I'd like Mr. Dick Fuliano to, to say a few words. Sure. Um, in 1988, I was appointed uh, East Chester Town Historian. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, a few months later, the head of the planning board, we had no master plan in Eastchester, Ed Hoffmeister invited me up to his apartment on Garth Road. And he said something to me that still rings true. Architecture is history frozen in time. Um, and uh, in 2006, uh, Mike Fix, Sheila Marcotte, um, we tried to get people interested in historic preservation. We developed a calendar, and uh, uh, it didn't have any legs. But then, uh, three years ago, when we heard that what I consider, and many of us consider, the most historic house, not just in East Chester, but one of the most historic houses in West Chester, uh, was uh, bought by Island College, and a developer had come in, and rightly so, he wants to make a profit. So we're doing all we can to work with the developer uh, to prevent that. Now, just a little background. The only <clears throat> East Chester, uh, the town of East Chester has two villages. The uh, historic town of East Chester goes back to 1664. Uh, Bronxville became a village in the town of East Chester in 1898. Uh, if I had a question answered, there was another village that today is a city. Does anyone know who, what that village, which is a city today, was? Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon. Uh, so East Chester uh, goes all the way down back then to the Long Island Sound. So we've been, uh, now, talking about historic preservation, um, what we heard that um, Tuckahoe how long did it take us, 18 months, two years, to get the legislation passed? And uh, Jeannie will talk about the pluses and minuses of historic preservation. Uh, and uh, there are different ways you can preserve a home. 
Uh, I don't go anywhere with it when we talk about historic preservation. Uh, I always tell people I have the architectural ability of an amoeba. Um, I, you know, I have trouble with light bulbs. But uh, uh, as far as the story of the people and the houses, again, architecture is history frozen in time. Now, the, our, I'm going to turn this over to Jeannie, and, uh, uh, and I know you're going to enjoy your presentation. Thank you. This is super. Thank you. So to get started, I don't know if everyone had uh, a chance to grab a piece of paper and a pen. It's not a quiz, but I thought that I would start by asking everyone to think in your own minds what historic preservation means to you. And I don't necessarily think we need words at this point to describe historic preservation. But if I were to ask you for number one to, to think about or to write down, let's think about New York City. New York City, this big place that we know and love and visit and bring friends to and talk about all the time. If you were to think about New York City and one place, a structure in particular, that you associate with New York City, what would it be? <laughs> totally subjective. There's no right and wrong, or wrong here. But just if you were to think about New York City, what pops in, into mind? Flatiron. Okay. Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty, Flatiron, Empire Road, State. Empire State? Customs House. Customs House. If I were to flip through my New York City Landmarks book here, I would find every single one of those sites and structures that you just mentioned in here as a New York City Landmark. Most of them, I believe, are on the National Register. I'd have to look up each one of those. But all of those structures that you just mentioned are landmarks. Which is cool, thankfully, right? We have them. How about if we were to think about Westchester, when you have friends coming or family coming in to visit, whether it's for Thanksgiving or a birthday or some sort of occasion, and you're thinking, where should we take them? What can we show off about Westchester County? What comes to mind as a place you might visit? Lindhurst. Lindhurst. Octagon House. Octagon, Octagon House. House. Which one? Payne Cottage. Payne Cottage. Payne Cottage all historic sites and structures that are living, thriving members of the Westchester community. How about if we bring it down to our backyards here and we think about Tuckahoe and Eastchester and Bronxville. And you can think about a pizza place where you met your spouse and it's totally fine too. But if you were to visualize, I know it comes to my mind immediately, but when I think about, for me, it's Tuckahoe. When I think about Tuckahoe, something just pops in. Does anybody have that too? Old Village Hall, for me, is in Depot Square. Yeah. Yeah. Just Depot Square. And it's so funny because I was rushing, running out the door this morning and I found um, a real estate brochure that came in the mail advertising real estate in Tuckahoe and the picture that they put was Depot Square. Mm -hmm. So it's something that the village and perhaps us collectively think of when we think of Tuckahoe. I mean, with Eastchester, anything come to mind with Eastchester? I heard that Twin Lakes was built by the firm of uh, a famous architect, but I've never heard any proof on it. Some of Twin Lakes, <laughs> some of the, the history associated perhaps with that particular area. I don't know the exact architect for that either. I don't know if that's something that, you know what, I don't know if maybe now's a good time to point out this out of the wilderness book. I don't know how many have seen this book. But this is the history of Tuckahoe, Bronxville, and <coughs> Eastchester. Includes Mount Vernon when it was part of the historic town of Eastchester too. But I wouldn't be surprised if that information is in here. So I'd be happy to share that with everyone. Uh, the schoolhouse. Schoolhouse. The marble schoolhouse. schoolhouse. Definitely a treasured component of Eastchester's history. Right. One that was preserved when the Eastchester Historical Society. Came it's together on, in the 50s. On the National Register too. Also on the National Register. I think of Town Hall. I think of Town Hall like you do, Tony. I think of oh, the right. Eastchester Town Hall. When I just, uh, an image that just pops into my mind on Mill Road, that's what I think of when I think of Eastchester. And all of these places are special, and I'm sure all of you were thinking of, of things that are valuable to you, and they are valuable. I guess what I mean to emphasize when I bring up these questions is because we think of our communities, whether it's our, our immediate or extended communities and the places that we love and cherish and associate with our time spent in these areas, 
And it's part of who we are. It's part of our memories. It's part of our experiences. We mentioned Town Hall, Depot Square. This year, I love this picture of Main Street Park in Tuckahoe, leading up into East Chester. And uh, this is downtown Bronxville. Is that ICS? ICS is up there in the corner, exactly, yes. Yes, you see that up there. That was before the, the road was developed. No gas station. Yeah. <laughs> that was prior to the gas station. We think of these places as, as part of our living, breathing communities. But what we don't always think about is how much things would change if all of, or any of those places we just mentioned just disappeared. Which is the heart of historic preservation, is that we know, love, and experience this as part of our collective and shared cultural, social, economic, and architectural values and history. But at any minute, if they're not historically preserved, if they're not preserved in one form or another, whether it's through a landmark, national or local, they could go the way of these sites here. We all know smokestack. the smokestack in Tuckahoe, one of the oldest smokestacks in the Northeast that came down a, just during the pandemic. Anyone recognize this one here? Penn That's the old Penn Station. That's the old Penn Station. This here, these are the quarries, uh, or one picture of that, the East Chester quarries. I don't know how much of that could have been preserved, but it's an interesting question about how the area might be different if we had tourists coming in looking at our quarries here. You had a question? So you said that so fast about what looks like a greenhouse. Could you go a little slower and, and tell a little more about that? Sure. This site here is an old image of the original Penn Station. Before the Penn Station that exists now was there, there was this large multi-block facility that had an architecture, some say more grand than Grand Central Station. You had the skylight coming in, you had an open airy feeling to it, you had passengers mingling with shops and restaurants, and this was torn down despite immense protest from the local community as well as the extended community. And it was a national issue. And does anyone remember who got super involved with this? Jackie. 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 Oh, thank you to Jackie and to the New York City Landmarks Commission. So as a result of that Penn Station coming down that a, a lot of people were just, just devastated by, right? It, it wasn't as though it was somebody's you know, backyard thing that they didn't care for anymore. This was a, a treasured national landmark, if, or at least city landmark, if, if we want to start at the basic. And it came down. And the good news is that it inspired a huge movement, which we're still living through today, which is the Landmarks Movement. It came, the legislation for New York City came about, and a lot of people's eyes were opened. Some of us in Tuckahoe say that the coming down of the smokestack was Tuckahoe's Grand Central, I mean, sorry, uh, Penn Station moment. Yeah. In that you realized anything, unless it was protected, it could just disappear, despite <coughs> community opposition. Here we have, I don't know how much community opposition <laughs> was uh, involved when this came down, but I don't know if anyone recognizes that. Is that the Bronx corner of Kraft and Pondfield? Bronxville Town Hall? That's the original Bronxville Town Hall. And I, where, it, was it at the corner of? I think it was right across from where the Hotel Gravity. Okay. It's, it's, there's a, uh, it's, right, it's across from where that uh, sporting yeah, goods the, store or uniforms are. Rugby, the rugby store. They had the town hall, they had the fire station, they had a pool inside there too. Now, did they have to take it down to build what they have to build? Maybe. I don't know, but I think it's gorgeous. What killed that was the automobile, because uh, Bronxville had 300 people when this was built. Um, 30 years later, they had 3,000, and the automobile, so they moved the uh, town village hall up to where the high school is and the library. So it was the automobile that killed that. I would love to have uh, a swimming pool in town hall today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is a, a picture from East Chester, a historic picture of East Chester, just to show us how much things change. Sometimes it has to, or does it? This is a question that comes up all the time in historic preservation. 
what are these site structures and spaces, what do they mean to a community? So these, unfortunately, all of these are now in the history books. They no longer exist. So that's setting the stage a little bit for the things that at least I think about when I think about what I value in my community and in our extended communities. And historic preservation, not just in New York City, but throughout the country, is viewing buildings as these indicators of where we've come as a society, where we're going, what do these moments in time that are frozen through the architecture have to teach us? What can we learn from them? But I want to just get it out there right now that it is not anti-development. You're not going to see me standing in front of any bulldozer that comes into town and saying, no, don't tear that down. I'm not anti-new construction, nor is the field of historic preservation. What historic preservation is looking at is, what are those special places that we value? And can we justify the community's interest in that as a reason to keep it from tearing down? So if we look at that generally as the, the definition of historic preservation, I think we can also look at historic preservation a, a little bit more in, in terms of what spaces do we, we live and move around in. And if they're old and things are changing around us, what can change about those buildings other than just tearing them down? We know that Depot Square has been changed how many times? There are no more horse hitching posts or water fountains for the horses in the middle, but it's still the, the active train station that we use on, on, on a daily basis. So we mentioned the, the, the Marble Schoolhouse, which is a living opportunity for children and adults to, to visit and learn more about the, the Marble past. The Old Stone Mill, which is technically in Yonkers, um, is a new restaurant, which <laughs> have a bunch of people been to that one already. <laughs> it's pretty good, right? Yeah. Um, the Parkview Casino is now condominiums. The Masonic Temple we know is offices for um, medical. Medical, let's call it. Let's leave it at that. Medical. Yes, there are a couple different versions of that, but yes, yeah, medical. And the old Riverview. I know some people here had worked in that building, and it's uh, Burroughs Welcome. Revlon. And Revlon, and if we go even further back, it was the Hodgman Rubber Company, but that's also condos now, too. So if, if these buildings can evolve over time, they are frozen in some ways, but I still like to think of them as, as living. So we can go back up to the, the picture here. Or we can go to the next bit. Um, so what happened in Tuckahoe? I said that we had what we called our Penn Station moment with the coming down of the smokestack. So a bunch of people inspired by Mr. Forleano, Dick Forleano, we, we, we thought, well, wait a second. What's next? What's coming down next? We keep hearing, oh, Westchester's running out of space. They need no more apartments. What, what next is going to come down and be placed with a parking garage or a condo? And a, a group of people got together and said, well, actually, I think we know what's next. It's going to be a ward house. Because it was suggested that Concordia College may be moving to close its doors and uh, what would happen if they were to start selling off some of the historic properties that they owned. So a bunch of people got together and said, well, what can be done? Historic preservation legislation is what can be done. And so a group of people got together, a task force was formed. This task force got into looking at, well, what is everybody else in Westchester doing? Are other communities in Westchester concerned about the same thing happening? Do they care? Do they want to do something? Turns out they do. <laughs> out of Westchester's 44 municipalities, before Tuckahoe's legislation was passed, there were 22 with historic legislation. How to say now 23 municipalities. So just over half of Westchester's municipalities have existing historic pres preservation legislation. Not just they're into historic preservation or they value or like old buildings, but they have codified this interest in historic preservation legislation. Well, what are they doing to preserve their buildings? And we looked at different versions of legislation and with guidance from the state, uh, historic preservation legislation was drafted that would meet Tuckahoe's need. It was debated for those who saw the the Board of Trustees meetings, it was debated for a number of months. In my involvement with that, which I can thankfully say from the, with the legislation was from the beginning, 
did not hear uh, from any of the meetings in this debate any opposition to the legislation. It seemed, and I still believe that it seems in the present tense, something that our communities value. If and when anyone convinces me otherwise, I, I'm, I'm open to hearing it. But I understand that this is something that we all, we all appreciate but don't recognize until it's too late or until something is um, really in danger. So now Tuckahoe has historic preservation legislation. And I can get into the specifics of this legislation as much or as little as, as anyone wants, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions about it. But what we needed to do with the legislation from day one was identify, okay, great, you get this legislation, what buildings in Tuckahoe would you consider worthy of landmarking? We came up with a pretty nice list. Perhaps these, these buildings are also something, uh, buildings that you treasure and value. The Ward House, which is not on the, the pictures here, but the Ward House and Crawford Monument, the, the Riverview Building, the, the, old, the original historic um, Village Hall, the Washington Hotel, they're not all here on the, on the pictures, but the churches, the temples in our community, we thought, wow. You can't throw a stone in Tuckahoe. And I'm sorry, I'm focusing a lot on Tuckahoe. We can talk about East Chester and Bronxville too, but you couldn't throw a stone and not hit something associated with Tuckahoe's marble history or something that was associated with Revolutionary War times right here in our backyard. So we thought, wow, there's, there's, there are really some gems here. What can we do if we want to preserve those? Um, and I'm not guaranteeing that all of these will eventually be landmarks, but they are on the list for consideration. And in the time since the legislation was passed, after uh, numerous Historic Preservation Commission meetings and Board of Trustee meetings, Tuckahoe now has two official landmarks. The Ward House at 230 White Plains Road and the Washington Hotel, the Samuel Fee Building. These two structures as Tuckahoe landmarks are given protection through the Tuckahoe Historic Preservation legislation. These buildings cannot be torn down unless they pose an imminent threat to the health, safety, or welfare of the surrounding area, where no one's gonna let these houses <laughs> harm anyone or anything <laughs> because they've been preserved, but uh, otherwise, unless the owner can prove hardship or an immediate danger, these are preserved for future generations of people who pass through Tuckahoe, who visit Tuckahoe. Uh, we, we, uh, can, will you get into details of what can or cannot be done to these buildings in the future? I do have a slide on the certificate of probateness. So let me throw this out there and you can tell me if this is kind of what you're thinking. <coughs> so the idea with these houses is that they need to, if it's a business, make a profit, if it's a residence, be inhabitable. So these buildings are right now essentially frozen in time. They, as, as time goes on and they need work, work that needs to be done to these buildings is done with the involvement of the Historic Preservation Commission. This is called a Certificate of Appropriateness. So, the, and, then, and let me stop right now and say something very important that I haven't even mentioned, which is these are only landmarked on the exterior. The interiors of these buildings are not open to the public. Well, in the case of the dentist, it kind of is. But these are, it's a private building, right? He doesn't have to open it up to the public, so. These buildings are exterior only. The owners of these buildings can do whatever they want to the interiors of these buildings. Don't have to tell anybody. Only if it were to compromise the exterior would, or, and trigger a permit request uh, for the exterior, would they need to involve the Historic Preservation Commission. Interiors, nobody's, nobody's asking to see or get involved with the interiors. Just the exteriors. They can do a ton of things to the exteriors. When they do them, they come through the Historic Preservation Commission, which stamps their request before they proceed. Now, I don't know if anyone saw the last Historic Preservation Commission meeting. Some of us were there. Um, but 
a, a proclamation was given to the owner of the Washington Hotel, the dentist who owns the, and operates the facility on the first floor. And it was to thank him because he told an awesome story about how his grandfather worked in the quarries and he had driven by this building as a kid and his aunt used to tell him, your grandpa worked there. And he just loved this building and he loved Tucker. And he had no idea that one day in the future he would buy this building and put his dentist's office there. So it, it means a lot to him. He, he's, a, he's a special guy. Like he, he's, he's the quintessential landmark owner, if I can uh, give him that uh, accolade. But even before the Tuckahoe Historic Preservation was a figment of anyone's imagination, or in anyone's imagination, he went out and ordered mortar. I think he got it from North Carolina. He said where it was. But he got the mortar that was the most, uh, that would match the existing mortar as much as it could, because he wanted to. Nobody told him he had to do that. No legislation required that he do that. He went out and did that. He has these, he loves to talk about the gutters. There are these unique gutters. This building's from 1883, and a lot, this, this is Takahoe marble on the facade. And he, he was like, we're not touching that marble. Let's leave it and work around it. So he did everything he could with artisans he had the means to do so. If he were to come to us and, and say, I need to replace the windows, I'm just going to say, well, you need to go back to 1883 and find some you know, original wood and match that. It's, it's a discussion about what it works and, OK, you're going to turn it purple. OK, great, but are, is your purple good? It, it's, it's all kinds of conversations about keeping this in line with the, the, the building that was preserved. Does that help at all? Um, the, the, the certificate, it's a process when you, when you apply for it and the meetings are held and samples are submitted, but the, the goal of the commission is to make it as easy as possible for landmark owners to keep the buildings certainly sustainable as long as possible. Someone just bought the, the Ward House. We can go into that one if anyone wants to talk about the Ward House. Um, but someone bought it and um, wants to do all kinds of things with it, namely tear it down. Sorry, you can't do that. Um, but the owner also, the architects made this, uh, anyone who saw this will know what I'm talking about, made this elaborate presentation <coughs> about how it's going to cost them an arm and a leg to go out and find, you know, $20,000 on this door and this door and this door. And we're like, whoa, wait a second. You just bought the house. Nobody's saying you have, where, where are you going? 1797? We're 1812? Like, where are you going? Nobody's saying this is the one and only path of historic preservation and you have to go now bankrupt because you have to put all this money into making this look historic. Some people choose to do so and take many years to do so. Other people um, can apply for grants. They can apply for tax incentives. They can apply for all kinds of funding from private in investors who look at that as, wow, historic preservation tourism is, is an important thing. Lyndhurst, look at all the money that Lyndhurst brings in. Look at Gilded Age that's filming there. Or look at historic Hudson Valley and Halloween and all of the businesses that benefit from that. The idea is to, to keep in mind, yes? How are these buildings used today? I understand board house is empty, mm -hmm. available. Can he make condos there? Or what, what are his limitations? No, well, that's a good question. And that answer relies at this point with zoning. So right now, the ward house is zoned residential. When Concordia owned it, it had uh, a special permit that allowed it to be used for uh, faculty and dorm housing which is a little bit more than just residential, right? There's a special uh, uh, interpretation of zoning that goes with that. But Tuckahoe is very supportive, if I can say, of the, the legislation and working with the owner. And at any point, anyone can put forward a request for a variance. That it happens all the time. And, and I'm not going to guarantee a, a result. Uh, would it be a condo? I don't know. Um, I don't know about that. Um, would it be a museum? Would it be um, uh, a restaurant? I mean, I, I don't know, because you have to take into consideration the needs of the neighborhood. And I know we, there's a Friends of the Ward House group that has been very involved in looking at the different options and 
Um, as long as we keep it standing, we start there. So that, that was the goal of the, the, or that was the result of the legislation, and um, right now it is zoned residential. So they could turn it into, or, you know, do whatever they want to the inside, and somebody can move in. But what about the Washington Hotel? Is it used for anything today? Oh, yeah, no, there's a, a, a dentist office on the first floor, and upstairs are apartments. And just down the road, up the road from, uh, or down the road south, is a Concordia, uh, Concordia Conservancy of Music, and they're doing very well. And that was restored in 1990, uh, and it's beautiful. Well, there, there are many options of how you can preserve a home and uh, not create a hardship for the owner. Uh, and this personally, when, when people say, what are you going to do with the ward house? Can I, I, can, I say, it's simple. At certain times during the year, it could be a historic museum. People can visit it, but it's not going to obstruct the neighborhood. Uh, it could be used as a small meeting place, like it was when Concordia had it. And people could meet there, you know, groups of 10, 12 people. It's not going to impact the neighborhood. It can be used for, I would say, faculty housing. I don't think you want to use um, there's plenty of dorm space over in Concordia right now that's going unused. But in fact, you know, we have the Chapel School and the Immaculate Con uh, Conception School. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's not going to change the nature of the neighborhood. I, I think people are concerned. They don't want to have people running around the neighborhood, disrupting the neighborhood. But um, when it was owned by Concordia, it wasn't a big problem. And um, nobody's recommending. I'm, I'm not recommending it. I don't think anybody going to recommend that. But right now, we're, people are so overwhelmed, they don't have the time to really concentrate. But uh, it would, uh, uh, about uh, 20 years ago, <coughs> I had a fire in front of the ward house. And uh, the man across the street uh, asked me, why are you here? I said, this is 20 years ago. I said, that's the most historic house in East Chester. And it was Tom Carpenter. He, he told me that story. And when I was teaching in East Chester, before Jack was, when Jack was in fourth grade, um, uh, 40, maybe you weren't even born 40 years ago, um, I had a lesson that fell flat on his face on the ward house. But I just did a YouTube video that makes it much more interesting. But uh, that's a long-winded answer to your question. So didn't the Friends of the Ward House make an offer to the current owner to buy that property and then use it as a potential museum? There is an offer to purchase it, right. yes, definitely. But not just as a museum. Right, or to for meeting space and such, right. A meeting space, yeah. uh, it was used for faculty housing. <laughs> and uh, office space, that's the other thing I left out. You go into Village Hall in Tucko, the Chamber of Commerce is there. You go to a lot of the, you know, the, the, there's space. So uh, this wooden roof, what I always say, it's not gonna impact the neighborhood at all. But the, the neighborhood has to be educated. Uh, people are worried about what's happening. There's or, uh, still a meeting isn't coming up on the 29th about the board house, right? Oh, when, the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. Right. There's a Historic Preservation Commission meeting, yes. Yeah, what time? 6.30, I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's at 6.30. Yes. Uh, yes. The, the, meet, the public meeting is still open for the consideration of the Certificate of Hardship that was presented. I was just wondering, what's the year uh, the ward house was built. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll give you the short version and then if you want to get into it. It's a cool story. So we call it the ward house because of the ward family that lived there. And Stephen Ward was the owner of the ward house when it was, uh, when it was burnt down by the revolutionary, uh, during skirmishes of the revolutionary war. But let's step back a little further because we, thanks to our historians, have this amazing record of information. So in 1754, a man by the name of Edmund Ward, of our Ward family, he's the one who built the house. But in 1754, he was involved in a deed, a, a, a deed, he represented historic East Chester and was negotiating with the Native Americans who were living on this land. And we know how much he paid for the land. We're talking barrels of cider and some guns. <laughs> it's, it's on the website. It's, it's really fat, and it's in this book too. It's fascinating. But we know that as a result of him representing East Chester in this negotiation, he also got a large parcel of land for himself and his family. 
and he chose to build his house right where it is now, this house. So we know he's standing um, at, in uh, the 1750s. During the skirmishes of the Revolutionary War, this house was burned down. After it was used as a, a loyalist headquarters, it has this fascinating history. This is not just some house. If, 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 and that's, that's, that's the, the, the very short story of it, but it was rebuilt in the 1790s on the exact same footprint of the original, which has been documented in a book by uh, Richard Bolton. Robert Bolton? Richard Bolton? Bolton. Bolton. Bolton, in, in who he had, he interviewed people who were around during the Revolutionary War and provided first-person accounts of, of the destruction, and it was documented back then that this house in the 1790s was built on the footprint of the original, which had been standing many decades earlier. So we say 1790s, but it was, it's even earlier than that. And then Concordia just bought it as part of their purchase of land there? Oh, so there's so much more that happened in between Edmund Stephen and then Jonathan Ward and then Concordia in the 1820s. Marble was discovered on this property. <coughs> Martin Van Buren, when he was president, came and stayed here when he was surveying the, the marble industry of this area. It was called the Marble Palace. It was, um, if, if you go even further back, the first post office in the area. And who was our postmaster general back then who would have laid the mile marker for that? Ben Franklin. Good old Ben Franklin put a mile marker outside of the Ward House. It's been moved to the park on uh, White Plains Road. Right. So it's no longer in front of the Ward House, but it still exists. Um, George Washington never slept at the Ward House. But on six different occasions, his um, his surveyors and subordinates gave him information mentioning the Ward House, the strategic importance of the Ward House during the American Revolution. So this isn't just any house. And I can contrast it to, just so everyone knows where the Ward House is. Do you remember the house across the street from it? Yeah. What we all call the Dutch Schultz, Dutch Schultz House? Yeah. A bunch of people came forward and said, whoa, they're going to tear this down. Can anything, it's gone, right? It's gone, spoiler alert, <laughs> it's gone. But we, the, the commission was asked, what can be done? What could be done? Here, with the Ward House, we have pages and pages and books and sources and photos and images and tons of history justifying its value to our community. The Dutch Schultz House, maybe Schultz burned everything, <laughs> which wouldn't surprise me, knowing the type of guy he was supposed to have been. But there was nothing that we could pull up, and it happened so quickly. It's hard to footnote uh, information from the mafia. <laughs> I, would, I would say that. But it's also, the historic preservation can't, my house is super old. I would love to, but what happened, what historic events happened at my house that justifies a legislation telling the owner you can't knock it down? It has to be of serious historical or architectural significance. Any truth to the legend that there were tunnels under the house? To, for him to escape. I'll leave that to... That's just a... We have, we have to have an archaeologist. I've heard that legend. I've heard that myth. Um, yeah. Uh, we'd have to get somebody... The owner wouldn't let us in right now, but an archaeologist could maybe tell us that. Uh -huh. And archaeology is really huge. And, uh, and you have an archaeologist. A person has a major in archaeology. Do. Yeah. So, so, could we sum up... The developer clearly wants to monetize that land or that house. He can't. So now we know that he can't knock the house down. I'm building that. Uh, what uh, What is he trying to do? What's this, what's this um, hardship uh, certificate or whatever that you were talking about before? What is he actually trying to do with the house? And is, he's in front of the zoning board now? <coughs> he's in front of the Historic <coughs> Preservation Commission. Oh. So right now, the owner is arguing that to put this house into a historic shape and get it on the market and sell it for a reasonable return would cause economic hardship. The historic preservation legislation gives very specific uh, requirements for what constitutes economic hardship. Someone mentioned, you mentioned that um, there has been an offer to buy the, the Ward House. If you don't want it, and you are not gonna make what you want it to make, you have every right to sell it. 
and uh, that is an option that may need to be exhausted before you can claim that you tried everything and are now experiencing economic hardship. So the, the conversation is ongoing. But what is it, you want to keep it a residence? You want to renovate it and keep it a residence? More the, more the way of Mick Mansion. He wants to. There's a there's an additional plot with that land that he wants to do what he did across the street and put up two. Uh, I, I imagine I'm, I work in real estate. I imagine you would want to put up two kind of upscale houses. Uh, the issue, though, is just in my professional opinion. I don't think he would be able to generate a reasonable return with what he's envisioning anyway. Um, and then when you know, just when he went in front of the board uh, in Tuckahoe, he uh, he gave an astronomical number, like 1.8 million dollars, to fix it. And he only had one contractor, who I imagine he works with very closely, and they would be able to fudge the numbers. Again, just my opinion, but uh, I don't think it would cost that much to renovate the inside and resell it. He, he bought it for 650 in a package deal from Concordia. And proposal was to renovate it. His proposal is to tear it down yeah. and build a new one. But so his argument is that he can't, it's much too expensive to renovate it and resell it. Yeah, but in that in that place, to tear down the ward house and build a whole new construction, I mean on the nexus of Route 22, busy road, like no privacy, I don't think a house there would sell for, you know, 1.8 million dollars, which is what he would want. Of course, the street though. He did. He did do it across yeah. the street, but those houses aren't on the market yet. And people, if you build it, they will come. I mean, we've seen. We've yeah. Seen that for sure. Yeah. But he can. So his his argument is, I want to tear it down. But you have legislation that says you can't tear it down. But there's a there's a what if in there somehow. Hardship. The only way to, <clears throat> to get around the legislation, the only way to get it torn down is to prove that it poses an imminent threat to the health, self, safety, and welfare of the surrounding community. Many meetings were held. He did propose that. And uh, architects came forward with reports, and it was unanimously decided <coughs> that it is not falling down in a state of disrepair, that it does not pose an imminent threat to the health, self, safety, and welfare of the, the surrounding area. There were people living it up until August of 2021. Okay, so that he lost on that or that, that's a, a cause for denial. The only other route to getting this thing knocked down is to declare that you've exhausted all options to regain what you put into it for a reasonable return, what which has the, not yet been proven. Was the preservation legislation in process prior to his buying the house? It was, it, it was in process, there was a task force but this is an interesting question that comes up in this particular scenario, but I would like to, to broaden the discussion beyond this house, just because I think it's valuable. Like the Washington Hotel, that's a landmark now, but when he bought that building, he didn't know that it was going to be landmarked either. So at any point in time, you could say, oh, why me? Which is why this is supposed to be a win-win for the community. We're not asking anybody to do anything other than not tear it down to start with. And I, I hope that seems fair um, and ultimately win-win. Now you were, I remember at the last meeting, you were very clear explaining that it wouldn't be like the village would be expecting him to do even preservation work right away, that he would have a period of time to do it. Sure. But my question, after listening to the back and forth that meeting was, would the argument be that he has to justify that he can't maintain it as a self-sustaining not-for-profit? Or is the argument here that he, he, he wants it to be a profit venture, but his designation is not that anymore? You understand what I'm saying? Is it, does, I mean, we're, we're at the Washington Hotel, that landlord has managed to keep it as a profit venture, and laudably so, and very creatively. In this instance, if he was to get tax abatements or to get grants, could he potentially sustain it as an historical property? I think that is that that appears to be. Those of us uh, friends of the Ward House have looked at that, and we believe that, especially with some of the county and state initiatives coming forth to Westchester 250, that there's going to be some real monies that are going to be coming down the pike to, to save it. 
but I, my question would be, is there an onerous amount of money that he is having to pay right now to keep it going, or is this just smoke and mirrors? So it's an old building and it's going to need some work? Yes. For sure. Nobody's asking him to do anything to the property right now. He could go in tomorrow, or he could, go, he could have been doing this the past two years, go inside and do whatever he wants to it, to make it whatever he wants it to be within the zoning that I don't control, right? He can, whatever he's allowed to do, he can do to that house, right. and he can keep it or he can sell it. So this whole time he could have been fixing up the inside to make it a, a, a one-family house, he could have been pursuing zoning changes to, to make it into a multifamily. I don't know. Uh, well, but here's he, the other question. Is he required, as any homeowner would be required, to maintain the upkeep to keep any deterioration going on? Not only as any homeowner would be, but especially because it's a landmark. Yes. He cannot let it fall into a state of disrepair. Yes. That would be in total violation. And if anything were to come forward indicating that, there are daily penalties until it's brought back to uh, keeping that from happening. It, I, I feel a little compassion for him. It's too bad he bought when he did and didn't know. But is there anyone that has stepped up to it? To Is there anyone that's saying, hey, listen, I understand. I'll give you 700 for it or something like that. Is there anyone that's willing to buy from him to make him just feel like he got, he didn't have any, just basically cut his losses and let him go? and have someone else buy it? So I feel comfortable saying that something that was said at one of our public meetings, which was that someone came forward and his story is known if you're interested in this guy. Someone who used to live in Winslow Circle came forward and said, I will buy this house. And so yes, someone has offered money to save this because of the incredible value of this house. So people who know what that value is. You don't have to feel sorry for him. I, I if, mean, I, if I might, if I might add something, um, I, I'm a part of Friends of the Ward House. Uh, he didn't just buy the Ward House; he bought six other properties, and the net profits on what he sold the other ones, except the Ward House, for were in the millions. Uh, he's also on the board of directors of a of a bank, and its public record from the SEC has about three and a half million dollars in stock from them. So I, I wouldn't feel sorry for him. <laughs> it is an objective legislation, which needs to be applied objectively. In the legislation, it says that the owner needs to prove that a reasonable rate of return has been sought. So a reasonable rate of return, I think, is a good starting point. So this legislation is not intended to, to, to have anyone lose money. Jenny, I just think yes. uh, we might want to just mention about the moratorium. Oh, uh, that's a good idea. When, um, that's no. a good idea. I get into what the legislation um, covers. Oh, that was going to be my, my question I had. But let, let's leave some, we'll leave this picture there for now. Yes, at one point, Tuckahoe enacted a historic buildings moratorium, which prohibited the demolition of any buildings that had been included in Tuckahoe's comprehensive master plan. We're on that list at the beginning. The one we had at the beginning. Yes, let's the go scientist. back there. Yeah. Let's go back there. So Tuckahoe has a, mass, a comprehensive master plan. And in that comprehensive master plan, yeah. a number of buildings, including Washington Hotel, including the Ward House, including all of the churches, are pointed out. And this is, we're going back decades of this master plan. They're pointed out as being of incredible value to the community. And groups of people came together and said, what makes Tuckahoe Tuckahoe? And they put pictures. Uh, that picture I had of the Washington Hotel, that came from the master plan. So Tuckahoe enacted historic buildings moratorium that prohibited the demolition of any buildings in that. Now the historic preservation legislation has been enacted, so anything that is, is a, a landmark cannot be torn down. I'm a little bit uh, bothered by the fact that the Marble Schoolhouse has been housing the fire department <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and its visits and community meetings. Is there anything to push it along? The firehouse where they belong has been in construction for, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight no. years. I mean, the Mar it closes the Marble Schoolhouse for everything. I know. And that's not right. I know. 
We can't well, wait for it to be back up and. Is there prohibiting that? I mean. So, this was going to be a question that I asked, and I'm so sorry that we're running out, uh, out of time, but um, one of the questions I was going to ask, and we'll, we'll come to your, then, no, I don't have any power to do anything about that. I wish that there was something that could speed it up a little bit, but they're, they're, they keep saying anything now. <laughs> but I wanted to mention the Marble Schoolhouse and Tuckahoe High School, which are both in East Chester. Our national, or on the National Register of Historic Places. My question was going to be, does Tuckahoe have any landmarks that are National Register sites? It's a trick question, because Tuckahoe High School is, but it's in East Chester. <laughs> Their address is actually East Chester. So the answer is no, Tuckahoe does not have any National Historic uh, Register of Historic Places. But my next question would be, what do you think gives more protection to a historic structure? being listed on the National Register of Historic Places or being landmarked locally by local legislation? Local. So before I got into this, I thought it was National Register, and most people do. They think any structure on the National Register is protected. It's acknowledged, it qualifies for grants, it's incredibly valuable, but if nobody's maintaining it, it can come down. There's nothing keeping National Register of Historic Places from coming down. The local legislation, which involves months of meeting and public discussion, and for the Ward House, I think it was a 65-page application, and testimony from architects, all this stuff keeps it from being torn down. So the answer is the strongest protection for historic preservation is local legislation. New York City, too, it's the New York City the landmarks. I think have these meetings. If you follow them all the time, everybody wants to tear everything down in New York City. And if it's just on the National Register, a lot of time they get away with it. Uh, but if it has stronger protection through the local landmarking, there's more of a discussion that's held. There's still ways to get around it. Does East Chester have a comparable law at the moment? No. And Bronxville doesn't either. Has there been any discussion? <laughs> Now, what's interesting, Bronxville, which has numerable places on the historic register, has no historic preservation. There was a house, the Underhill House. Uh, the Underhills go back to uh, before uh, 1636, when there were problems with the Native Americans. That house was sold, uh, and a, a week later it was torn down. It was done by a significant architect. So. Uh, uh, it's important to have historic preservation laws, but it's also, there are all different kinds of historic preservation laws. Some are so bad you can't uh, change anything inside or outside your house, but that's not the type of law. No, interior protection is very strict. It has to be open to the public. So I, I would love to do the interior of a, of a home, for example, but there, it's, it's hard to, to get, to justify that. You know, these are people's personal spaces, private spaces, whether it's a business or a residence. So that's, uh, that's crossing a line in many ways, uh, the, according to the legislation. Uh, but if it's, the word, yeah, can I just a say, lot on the word half. Gene, I just want to add one other thing. <clears throat> I've been passionate about this. Once uh, that house is taken over, then we have to go out to the whole community because then you need a plan, a, an intelligent plan, how you're going to keep this uh, in effect. And that's why it's really, really important. And I know there are people out there, but we really get, got to get that plan articulated and get people to uh, to back our plan. Uh, because, you know, Tucko, you know, there are houses where, uh, <clears throat> where they're taken over and uh, they just deteriorate. We don't want that. If we're really proud of being in the historic town of East Chester, we're going to go out to the general public. Uh, grants will help, but it, it's really a very big issue uh, that we have to look at. A, a, a sustainable plan of action is really important. Once, and and you know, if I was on the Tucko Village Board, they have to do what's best for the community. And that's something to really consider. Uh, reaching out. And I know there are people out there uh, that will do that. Uh, make 
pledges that if the house is taken over, that they will contribute to that. Uh, I saw that with the 350th. I saw it with Drugger Together. I've seen it with the 9-11 uh, Museum. This is a wonderful community, and we have to be proud of our traditions. That's really important. Dick, could you mention something about Westchester 250? What's going to be happening with that? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> there's a group called Westchester 250, and they, they've been running programs for the last four years. They'll run a program that will be a thousand people. They'll be reenactors. When it, uh, if you want to stay here for another two hours, I can tell you. <laughs> but uh, the one that I'm most excited about, we're going to reenact the Battle of White Plains at Power Ridge with 500 reenactors. Um, but, and I always uh, <clears throat> say this Westchester County, East, the town of Eastchester, has the most important and the most overlooked role in American history. And we got to publicize that. You walk into town hall, what do you see? The East Chester Covenant. What an amazing document, and most people have never heard of it. And it says simply, the people of this town since 1664 will be compassionate, honest, and hardworking. Uh, uh, birthplace of the freedoms of the Bill of Rights. You know, I can go on and on, but I want to turn it back to Jeannie because I get bored listening to myself. <laughs> I have a mundane question, I guess. But my wife and I took a tour of the historic houses of New Rochelle uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we were impressed by the fact that there were plaques in front of many of these houses, many of them, uh, indicating what and where and who and so forth. I don't seem to see that in Tuckahoe, East Chester. Um, are we missing something? Is there a reason why we don't have to identify these houses and made, you know, so the Washington Hotel has a nice plaque on the wall that they put up on their own. As part of local landmarking efforts, the goal from day one has been to recognize these structures. Uh, with the Ward House, we're waiting to see what happens. The Washington Hotel already has one, but I, I, I think it's important. We did a presentation at the Historic Preservation Commission on all of the plaques and monuments in Tuckahoe, and there are tons. It's funny when you actually, it was Lois. Lois is right here. She Lois would have done the pictures of, of yeah. a lot of them. And just walking around, you don't always remember that you pass five on your way to the train sometimes because they're, they're for individuals. Um, but, but New Rochelle does a great job and we would love to join them. We could get Pomeroy's, which are those yeah. plaques that are on the road standing up. Um, that you see at the Payne House, someone mentioned the Payne Cottage, they have a nice uh, marker. We could get one. those. There was one at the there Ward House. There was one, the yes, there was house. One. There was one of yeah, those outside the Ward House. It's long gone. Where did it go? You, you go through Hastings. They have an um, unbelievable number of uh, plaques, and they, they even have a guided tour where you, you can go around and you put earphones in, and you can listen to the significance of each house. But the Centennial Tour, if you wanted to, we do have online the Centennial Tour, if you're interested in Tuckahoe history, that took place back in 2002. Richard was a part of that, uh, and actually the culminated at the Ward House. Um, but it's a bus tour, and my mother's one of the, the people on there, so, so it kind of takes you through the village. And, and took Oh, okay. Then, yeah. So it's... No, but okay. the question is... Yeah. As the friends of the Ward House, yeah. why haven't, gone, haven't you gone and stuck another plaque in front of it? Good. Because that would, that would really have to be done. Yes, we're working. I have the street. The East Chester Historic, that's what the East Chester Historic You have to do it through the Palmer Foundation. We have it all, it's, it's in the works. We've been having trouble having meetings yes. because uh, and they're going to be out of there. What about but, rich and famous people? Yeah. We had to oh, see all the different things that came that. out of that cool? and Rochelle. I'm sure we have them here too. We put it here. We've got marble. We've got incredible marble history. Yeah. We've got a revolutionary Actors. war house Actors. right here. We've got it. We've got a ton of history. So if I could maybe sum it up like you did very eloquently, I think historic preservation comes down to recognizing the sites that, as a collective community we value, whether it's Lynnhurst or Grand Central Station or the Ward House, that these buildings have been where they are for as long as they have for a reason, and that we can continue telling those stories for future generations 
but we do so intentionally because we wake up one day and they're gone. But if we want them to stay as a community, there are ways that we can do so, and that is historic preservation. So a little bit Jenny, over. can you guys put, I know you, I've seen your slide before, just the process, I think that's really okay. helpful. Sure. I saw that you had that there. Oh. Of your wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the yeah. wheel. Because I kind of think it's helpful for everybody to see. Yeah, it's it. definitely many months of review and for kudos any... kudos to Jenny really speaking to all those municipalities and doing all the legwork to figure out the best practices um, oh, thank you. in New York State. And it's very cool what other communities are doing and, and, and to join that. I think respects the, the history that we have here. And yeah, my name is Dr. Powers. Thank you for the presentation of Mr. Foley Allen. Um, I don't go anywhere without Jeannie because <laughs> I, I would be uh, I would be terrible. <laughs> so I always thought, think of history as being people, um, and I don't know why. When I was in the eighth grade in the Bronx, I received the history medal from the Ancient Order of Hibernians. Okay, so I didn't stay with history, but I wound up going into science. But there you go. Anyhow many interesting things about the Ward House. And uh, I think that the history of the Ward House can teach the students about what's going on today. So you had the Ward House really had a divided community then. So you had people, one of the Ward brothers was on the side of the American Revolution. My understanding is the other brother who had the property that's today Simonoy Country Club was for the king, for George III, okay? So you here you have a divided society back then. Um, the other thing is that uh, that was occupied, I think, for at least four days by General Howe, okay? And General Howe grew up 110 miles northwest of London and what is today Sherwood Forest and Robin Hood. His house, where he grew up, is a historic place in England. And people may not realize it, but Howe actually was in charge of the British forces in North America. So not only did he go up to Reed's Hill or Bunker Hill in Boston, but down to Philadelphia. Um, so very important historical things. Um, and fast forward the 1850s, my understanding is that area that goes from uh, 22 Mill Road and over to the Hutchinson River Parkway, that was inhabited by the famine Irish, mm -hmm. okay? The potato, potato famine. And they have to have in the Ward House 1850, the first Catholic Mass in this area. So that's just touching on some of the very important historic areas that can be used to teach the kids today about the history and what's going on. So it would be a tragedy. I mean, they, just my opinion, Europeans tend to have more of a sense of history and preservation than quote unquote Americans. And capitalism can move forward, but it doesn't have to be at the price of destroying history. Mm. And I'll finish up with the last thing. <coughs> they had something on the internet yesterday about the British warships, the present ships. I knew nothing about this. Mr. Forliano has told me about it in the past. But Captain Crawford was bayoneted by the Queen's Guard, I believe. Queen's Rangers, yeah. Oh, okay. The Queen's? Rangers. Rangers. Okay. Loyalist militia. All right. And they brought him down to the field hospital, believe it or not, was in Kingsbridge, okay, in the Bronx, and he died somewhere in transit. But I'll tell you, these a lot of people died on these prison ships, and they had something on the internet about it yesterday. So many different things about the history of this country, the history of England, the history of Europe. And the last comment is uh, how 
not only was the British American Revolutionary War general, but he also fought in the French and Indian War, and he fought in Quebec. He was there on the, the, the plains of Abraham. Enough out of me, thank you. <laughs> A ton of history and, and an opportunity to, to keep that history alive. If only we could keep the people alive, right? But the walls are there, and I think they do talk. Ward House has original timber on the third floor from the 1790s. They, I think they, they're talking. <laughs> uh, they have something to teach us about indigenous craftsmanship and materials. But those trees were fully grown by the 1790s. I think it's fascinating. Uh, but thank you for pointing out the, the people. Yes, historic preservation is about preserving the history of the people that have come before us for the people who are after us. So should we leave it at that? Should we do one more? Yes. I have a question. Since you brought up like trees and stuff, does the historic preservation apply at all to the trees? Because they've been cutting down a lot of really old trees. I know some of them are like pre-Civil War trees with like no care for so a lot history. Of, a lot of villages have tree ordinances. Tucko yeah. has one. Like I think Mamaroneck did something. You can't cut them down by a certain girth. Yeah, so we have one. Yeah. Yeah. How that was got around, I have no idea. Yeah, Tucko has house. it. There are tree ordinances. Is there one in East Chester? The white oak. That's the a white good oak question. Have been protected over the years. Just the story I specific heard. trees. The story yeah. I heard, Dick. Maybe you know the verify this. Apparently, there was a there is an arborist book of the white oak. Some of them are 250 no, plus know. years old wow. along Post Road. I think they're, to some extent, protected, correct? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I just don't know. I know the town does takes a great bit of care with, with the white oaks along, along the Post Road. It might be worth asking if there is a tree ordinance in, in the specific communities. I know Tokoho had You need permission before you can knock down a tree. Call town hall. Town hall. Leave it on that. And I'd just like to remind everyone the meeting is the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, 6.30 at the Tuckahoe Village, if you're interested in the Thank warehouse. you, thank you, yes. And these are some great, oh, this is, I didn't mention this book, super cool book, Picturing Our Past. Goes up to 2011, but has all of the national register sites in Westchester County, hundreds of them. They're all in here with photos and stories. And I talked about New York City and the Out of the Wilderness book, too. The super, thank you so much, thank you.